we're not in Kansas anymore. Welcome, Welcome to Mo Banshee's Lair, Visionary Talk Radio on Pararock Radio. We're still rocking your world. Goodbye, my son. Where you are going, I cannot follow. But I have instilled in you my strength, my knowledge. I wish you good luck with your mission. And perhaps one day, our paths will cross again against this vast expanse of time and space. Welcome to Mo Banshee's Lair, Visionary Talk Radio on uh, Pararock Radio. Uh, that was the intro for uh, the, the new uh, movie by Hollinsworth uh, Productions, and it's uh, called The Rising Light. And uh, we're going to bring our guest on in just a, a few seconds. I, I hope you guys are all really going to like it. Um, just a, a little short reminder, please, everybody. Animals are not weatherproof. If you see an animal out in the elements, please report it to your local, uh, you know, humane society. Somebody like that. Don't go over and pick a fight with the person. Just go get the AS. He hears nothing now. I'm talking. Okay. You guys can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, Lady A hears me, so it's okay. Um, so anyway, um, if you can, um, yeah, it's on. If Lady's hearing me, it's got to be on, right? Uh, sure. Hmm. Yeah. Don't you love it when a show comes together, you know? Exactly. It's live. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, it's live radio. That's that's it. Live radio. If you think doing movies is tough, you ought to do ro- live radio. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Animals, if you see an animal in trouble, report it to your local authorities. The ASPCA, uh, your, your humane society, whoever. Uh, the other thing is there's a lot of things that are going on right now. There was a big train accident um, in New York and... Um, you know, there's a lot of sad stuff in the news, and um, all I can tell everybody is it's just life. We we have to get through it, people. We're all in this together. It sucks, but, uh, you know, people make bad decisions. People think they're, you know, they're going to live forever. And there's been a lot of uh, that the actor out in California who who died and the the young man with him. It's just terrible stuff. But you know what? It's all life. And uh, you just got to kind of suck it up and get past it. And 
we're sorry for all the terrible, terrible things going on in, uh, on the earth. It's just one of those things that happens, and we're really, really sorry about it. So everybody just kind of try to get past it. And my other thing I'm going to say is it's the holidays. If you don't celebrate any, that's cool. That's cool. Do whatever you do. Just don't call my house telling me not to say Merry Christmas because I'm a Christian and I'm going to say Merry Christmas. That's just the way it is. It's Merry Christmas and it's Happy Easter. But I will say ha Happy Hanukkah to my Jewish friends. Uh, they're going through Hanukkah right now, and that's wonderful. And I hope you all get great things every day. And it's a blessing with your family. So I hope everybody's holidays are just really, really cool. Um, everybody. I want everybody to have wonderful holidays. And if you're alone, do something about it. Go out, get get involved someplace. Don't be alone during holidays. Um, it, it's it's okay to go out and make friends or go out and volunteer. That's a, that's a good thing too. Our guests are on. Ansel Farage is on. Nathan Wilson and Derek Mobratton. Um, they are the uh, director and producer and. Um, Actors in the new movie, The Rising Light. And uh, I want to welcome you guys to the lair. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Yeah, um, you guys have been busy since the last time we talked, huh? Yeah. Yes, yes, we have. It's been fun. And that's good. That's good, yep. right? Busy is good. Busy is good. It's busy and having <laughs> a good time, like what we like to do. Yeah, yeah, um, it, because being an actor or being in uh, making movies and stuff, it can be so, um, it can be dry spells, and then, and then it can get scary, and, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it, busy is always preferable to uh, not being busy. Um, Ansel, you're, you're, um, you're pumping out some, a lot of uh, projects, huh? Yeah, I've been uh, I've been keeping myself occupied since um, actually since before even Doctrine Reviews came out. Um, the Rising Light we shot a couple months after we finished filming um, Doctrine Reviews, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it's, yeah, like yeah, like three three, three and a half months, months yeah. afterwards is when we kind of started up on the Rising Light. And then um, right after that, I ran right into Doctrine Reviews too, and then uh, then I've just filmed an Edgar Allan Poe short, so I've been quite busy since. Uh, Actually, for the past year and a, a half, year, really, yeah. a couple of years now, yeah, like nonstop. So, yeah, and now everybody. How do you do it? How do you do it? How do you keep the momentum going? I, I don't know. I'm just sort of a workaholic, I guess. I just keep going. I keep coming up with ideas. Right now, I'm sitting here, and I've got my notebook out. That's I'm writing another <laughs> script for another film, and um, I just, I just do it. I, it's what I've always wanted to do. So I figure now I've been given this opportunity to, to do it. So I might as well take advantage of it and um, mm -hmm. just keep working and, and get as much out there uh, as possible. You see, I'm nice old. To yeah, I nice have to, to write to, like, stuff down. Oh, go ahead. I, I'm old, so I have to write things down. So I, I understand when you say you're sitting there right now writing ideas and stuff so you don't forget them, right? Yeah, yeah, it's like compulsive. <laughs> and who was yeah, just talking, Nathan? Oh, uh, yeah, this is Nathan. Nathan Wilson. Okay, uh, what were you saying? It was. It's nice to have somebody like Ansel, you know, around because he's always doing stuff. He's always got ideas. He's always writing stuff and trying new things. And a lot of people in L.A. they want to do these things and they want to write this. You know, everybody talks about writing a new script or going out and making a movie, and they always talk about doing it, but nobody seems like ever does it. Where it's nice mm -hmm. that Ansel actually talks about it, and then he actually goes out and actually does it as well. So mm -hmm. it's actually nice to be around somebody like that. Thanks um, that. Yeah, he, yeah, he's a very busy person. And Derek, we're going to get you to jump in here if we have to pull the words out of your mouth. Um, <laughs> you're, yeah, Ansel, you seem to be going the way of um, John Ford, Orson Welles, Tim Burton, uh, even Hitchcock had his favorites. And, uh, you know, the core people that he could go to because he knew exactly what he was going to get from him 
And uh, you seem to be going the same way with your actors and actresses, huh? Yeah, I've just, I'm just building my own repertoire company, and uh, that's been really great. As I can just call up you know, Nate or Derek and say, hey, I want to do, I'm thinking about doing this. Do you want to be involved? And you know, they either tell me, yeah, I'd love to, or they turn me down because they're doing something else. But you know, I've got that great pool of actors to, um, to work with. You know, I mean, even you know, Catherine and, and Jerry and Chris. And, uh, and a whole bunch of new actors that I just worked with on uh, the second Doctor and Beast are just, we're just like a, I mean, how do you describe it? Yeah, yeah we, we started small, and now we're just kind of expanding on our friends and other friends, and we bring into this movie because, like, we'll need somebody to do a couple lines or play a smaller role or whatever in the film. And it's like, well, my buddy's an actor, and he could he's perfect for this. Then we'll bring him in, and then it seems like a, then he just kind of brings little more to the family and, and then like you just somebody else is getting rotate added. with each project and then add new new people to uh, mm-hmm. each project. Yep. And we we did some casting for uh, Doctor Mabuse too. Yeah. And um, we brought some other people on that was they're amazing as well. So and we're going to definitely use them again. Mhm. Um, Derek, uh, you seem to be in two movies now, the bad guy. <laughs> yes. Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't argue he's the bad guy, but um, yeah, they, they definitely seem to be uh, two characters that are seemingly misunderstood, um, you know, to the audience. But they he, both both characters are very grounded in their in their opinions and uh, their convictions and you know what they're trying to achieve. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, on the surface, it definitely does seem like the bad guy, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, because uh, in, in the first one. You, you you know, I felt bad for you and Dr. Mabuse. I mean, you know, here you've been schlepping for this guy and you've been his toady and then you find out he's not going to make you king of the castle. You know, that's got to suck, you know. So I can understand that uh, the, the second one that I watched tonight, I got to see it early, uh, The Rising Light. Um, you're, uh, again, uh, you're... You're the bad guy. You're the heavy in it. You've got to take this incredible uh, being who is very innocent, and you got to deliver him and serve him up to the bad guys, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, uh, doing all that with a uh, with a friendship on the surface, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, it, it, they're definitely just they're very uh, their mentalities are very youthful. They have very youthful mentalities. You know, the the idea of trying to attain power at a young age is is a very dangerous thing. It's like a, a, a rattlesnake, you know, a little baby rattlesnake who has all the power of the venom but is not quite sure how to use it yet. Mm-hmm. It's funny you bring that up. My granddaughter has a friend who um, had a, a python, a, a young python, and every night she let it sleep by her on the pillow. And she took it to the vet a couple of weeks ago because she said instead of curling up, it was starting to lay straight next to it. And the vet says, uh, we're putting it to sleep right now. And she said, why? He says, because it's trying to figure out if it can fit you and eat you. He says, it's gone oh, rogue now. we got to kill it. <laughs> that'd be miserable. Wake up the python in your face. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, you know, it's a baby. It doesn't quite know what it's going to do, but it's going to do something eventually. Mm-hmm. Um, the the movies are, are, are great. Um, very uh, sci-fi-ish. I don't know if that's a word. I'm getting looks. Um, yeah. But it, it is. It's very... Um, and it, this is not a criticism. I think I really like it because I liked... The old Doctor Who, the very futuristic idea of the old Doctor Who. I know, I don't think you guys watched the original ones. No, um, the, the early sort go of ahead. Like, sort of looking towards the Jetson type of futuristic uh, world that they would do in the old, the early series of Doctor Who. No, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. I always like that sort of world. It's so fake and so retro and yet futuristic at the same time. And, and I think that we should do more science fiction movies like that rather than um, Terminator or something like that. <laughs> like this kind of well, yeah, because it's stuff like Terminator and stuff like that, I mean, it's just shock value. You don't have to think at all. Um, but, um, you know, uh, 
So also your it's, movies, uh, I actually have to think, not hard. I mean, I can follow it very easily, yeah. but it makes me think. Yeah. Yeah, I, and also that, that whole sort of retro futurism, it's just got a nice sort of aesthetic quality to it. And, and yeah. I mean, this back to with like Doctrine Reviews and the sort of steampunk aspect of it. I just, mm-hmm. I don't know, I kind of like those sort of retro worlds, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, that's what I go for. But but anyway, yeah, no, it's I, I try to make, you know, something that's going to entertain you, but also something that you'll you'll think about, hopefully, as you're watching it. And, you know, maybe it'll be on a, a more subtle level, or it might, you know, as long as you're thinking about some of the ideas that are that are in the story, I think I've done my job. And as long as you had mm-hmm. fun also watching it. Right. That's, that's, that's it. You know, if, if it's not fun, you know, it can be, you know, what the hell am I watching this for? But, but it is fun. Um, I, I sat and watched it. And the music for this uh, new movie, The Rising Light, um, very ethereal, uh, very higher purpose type of music, you know. It, it puts you in mind that uh, there's going to be a showdown between good and bad, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Bill Wendell, he's he's brilliant, you know. He's uh, I've been working with him for a while now, and uh, he's one of the best composers out there. And uh, I'm so grateful to him. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, Nathan in... Uh you're you you're the good guy in this movie. You were the good guy in Mabuse, but in the second Mabuse, you're going to be the bad guy now, right? Um, maybe I might. You might have to uh, check out the first one if people haven't seen it. Yet. Yeah. But um. I did see the first one. Did. Uh, the end where sh- he's got the key well, and. Let's, oh, let's um. The DVD. I have to say, I know I gotta I gotta come clean on this one. We've had a couple shipping delays and whatnot and what have you, but I gotta say the Doctrine Abuse DVD is coming out at the end of this week for anybody that's listening that really wants to have it. And um, I think let's let them find out what's gonna happen when they see it in uh, as soon as they can order it. Yeah, I but. I've got mine and thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Um go ahead. But, yeah, I think last time we talked, uh yeah, you hadn't seen the actual movie yet, so I yeah. It's nice to have you seen it now? And haven't yes, seen it I have seen it. Yeah, I watched the whole the whole thing twice. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah to yeah. my parents when they watched it, they, uh, they were like, oh, we loved it the first time, but the second time it was like, we got it, we got it more. And it was like, oh, my gosh. It's, oh, yeah, we didn't miss that the first time. Missed this the first time. So yeah, that's, yeah. That's if what, you uh, blink. Hopefully we are going for Yeah, so that's a compliment. Yeah, it's a complicated movie. You, you definitely need to see it at least twice. But, um, yeah, it, yeah, if you blink, you you or you <laughs> let it run while you're going to the ba- to the bathroom, you're in trouble. Yeah, which is nice to have a kind of not complicated but somewhat complicated script. Or it's very tight. So yeah. like every word or a lot of words that we are saying and using are important for a reason, and they're there for a reason. So nice to have that. Uh-huh. Um, you've got so much going, uh, Ansel. Uh, I mean, I don't. I don't know how you keep it all straight between all the projects you're doing. Your uh, your site is www.hollandsworth, H-O-L-L-I-N-S, worthproductions.com. Um, yeah. This movie that you're, Dr. Mabuse is coming out on the 6th, right, on DVD? Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay, and, and so everybody can, where can they find it? Uh, you'll be able to order it through the Dark Shadows Festival, um, mm-hmm. which is in Maplewood, New Jersey. I, the address escapes me at the moment. But um, if you check the uh, Hollandsworth Productions website or even the Doctrine Abuse website, www.doctrineabuse, uh, spelled out D O C T O R M A B U S E, hyphen the movie.com, you'll find all the ordering info. Uh, also, the Doctrine Abuse Facebook page, Doctrine Abuse 2013. It'll be all mm-hmm. over, and uh, you'll be able to order it through the Dark Shadows Festival mm-hmm. in time for the holidays. Yes, and now this other movie, when is it coming out? Um, Rising Light will be online to watch this Friday um, on YouTube for free, <laughs> and uh, so everybody can see it. There's also going to be a, a sneak peek to uh, the Dr. Mabuse 
that got postponed. Oh, it did. Well, <laughs> We've had a couple soon, of then soon we will be also be putting out, I guess, the uh, first couple minutes of Dr. Mabuse 2 at Teo Pumar. Okay, well. so Rising Light will be free. You're not you're not selling it. No, not at the moment. We're just um, we. I know a lot of people want to see it, and uh, with Doctor Abuse One, you know, a lot of people wanted to see that as well. But they were sort of limited to either coming to the premiere in San Diego or coming to some of right. the Los Angeles theatrical screenings, and uh, they had to wait and <laughs> for the DVD. With this, I wanted as many people as possible to see it, so we're putting it out mm-hmm. online, you know, so you can watch it on your computer, on your tablet, on your PS3, on whatever electronic device you have, and uh, and enjoy it, you know, and you know wherever and whenever you are. So, mm-hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about this one um, tonight. Uh, the the uh, rising light. Uh, it's a sci-fi movie. It's it's um, it's a science fiction, and it's and I'm just reading what you have on your trailer. So it's it, you know I'm not giving anything away. It's right. the arrival of a being from another world. It's starring Nathan Wilson, Kath, Catherine Lee Scott, Lyndon Childs, Derek um, Mobratton. Um, it's written by Ansel. Um, this is uh, a, a kind of a, a uh, extraterrestrial being, some kind of life form being dumped in the middle of uh, the world now today, right? Right. And he and, has uh, a purpose. Yeah, he has to. Um, he sent on a journey to find this uh, ancient magician, <laughs> and um, gets kind of caught along on this very sort of bizarre road uh, journey with this very strange young man um, named Alex. And uh, it, it, it's a very hard film to kind of describe in like you know, one sentence. Uh, basically, I just keep telling people it's a science fiction road movie and mm-hmm. filled with various surprises and twists and turns. And it's a, it's a very unconventional science fiction film, but uh, hopefully one that people will enjoy. Um, let's talk uh, uh, about Lyndon Childs. Uh, yes. He he has a prominent place in this uh, new movie that's coming out, The Rising Light, 2013. Um, he uh, he passed away um, unexpectedly in in May, I think. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it's two months after. Yeah, he finished. Uh, yeah, he. He is uh, one of those actors that when you ask the name, not a lot of people remember him, but the minute they hear his voice, he's got one of those voices, right? Am I wrong? And he had that voice, and I don't care if he was the Twilight Zone or Rawhide or uh, any of the other um, things he's done, and God, this guy... Let me just go through some of these. Uh, Frasier, Jag, Silk Stockings, Brotherly Love, Fly Away Home, The Rockford Files, Lois and Clark, The the Adventures of Superman. He was the Senator Black. Um, This guy has a a, a career that has gone back decades. And he's he's always been in, in the public eye, right? Yeah, yeah. He um, he did so much. He worked for Alfred Hitchcock on Marnie. Uh, he was on the original Twilight Zone. He started on Rawhide with Clint Eastwood. Um, mm-hmm. he, he did quite a bit, and I was very lucky to have him end up in in my films when I was you know st- not exactly starting out, but starting to really take filmmaking professionally. And um, to uh, have him in this, and I think it's one of his best performances. Uh, it was a really great honor, and then you know it was his last film, and uh, yeah, it's it's it was really sad when he when he died. Yeah, um, in most of uh, uh, not most, but a lot of his other roles he played because he's got that perfect square jaw. He always was a a, a military person or a government typey person. You know what I mean? In this he one, he's he's just like a guardian, a, a, a guy trying to, you know, 
to help us. You know what I mean? He's just, it's a different role. He, it, it was a softer role, I think, for him. Yeah, he always liked, he always told me that he wanted to do something, you know, weird and offbeat. He always wanted to play, actually, the Hunchback of Notre Dame, but never mm. could. And um, so he was always thrilled when I'd give him some insane script where he would be doing, you know, God only knows what. And um, so he really liked this character. This is actually the second time he played this magician role. We, uh, in uh, 2011, we shot uh, The Mystic Tales of Nicholas Winter, which is all about uh, his character, uh, Nick- Nicholas Winter the Magician. And he really liked mm-hmm. that character and wanted to do that, more with that character. So when, um, and I'd had this idea for this film for a while. And uh, when I decided, let's do it, I wrote his character into it. Um, you know, I always found a part for London. So I just put Nicholas Winter in there. He's, you know, he's come from a, a sort of strange Victorian setting into the modern world. But it works because he's a magician and he's lived for a thousand years. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, um, it, it's, it's a good, uh, it's a good um, balance for him. And very believable. I mean, I I really liked him in, in it, you know. And, um, you know, at the end, uh, it, it, it's kind of like you're rooting for them, you know. I found myself yep. rooting for him, you know. And I don't want to give away the story. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, we don't want, you know, no yep. swan songs here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, and th- and that's important if you care about the characters of it, you know. Um, Nathan, uh, did you have to let somebody beat you in the head with a baseball bat to make you, um, I I want to say innocent for this? Um, well, <laughs> yeah, actually, I got a, a yep. gigantic yeah, yeah, Anson would come out every day and hit me over the head to uh, knock some sense out of me. Right. No, yeah. um, when, when we when we started doing the film. Um, we were talking about just kind of what it was going to be about and kind of experimental and just kind of a lot of music and, you know, um, we were talking about kind of the innocence of a person who would come to Earth um, for the first time not knowing anything, not knowing the corruption, like, what of what humans are and mm-hmm. to just kind of trust everybody and just think everybody's, um, you know, great people or whatever and... He, you know, he knows nothing of the evil. Nothing the of the evil, and is like an, an infant baby coming out in a, you know, a uh, adult form, and walking around the earth and trying to figure out what's going on. But it's not all. Yeah, all he's evil. the. Go ahead. Well, yeah. It's not all evil, you know. He's he, he it's right because he encounters both. He encounters the good and the bad, and that's what's interesting is that you have to make the choice. You know, you you're going to encounter not just one or the other, but both things and. You know, you grow up and you have to... And that's the life in, in, in general itself, I guess. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, yeah, so, it's... But we were just going off of um, just the innocence of a, of a child coming to the earth and what would they experience for the first time if they were a little older and wandering around. Yeah, the difference, uh, like with Superman is he's a baby, he's raised by the Kent family, you know, and... He he knows the world. He knows what he's going to be up against. You know, this poor schmuck gets dumped <laughs> in California or wherever. <laughs> and it's like, okay, thanks, Mom. Yep, Love right, you. Hug. I'll figure it out. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's a good idea. Um, we're going to go to break, and I've got a, um, the uh, ending uh, score for that, uh, Bill Wandell, um, it's A Life Well Lived, and I, I wanted to play that because it is, it's a lovely score, I mean, you can have the best movie in the world, but if the music is lousy, you're sunk, do you know what I mean? It's very moving music, it is, it's great. It is, it is. It is extremely, so I'm going to play it for everybody, and then we'll be right back.
welcome back. Uh, that was the um, uh, the song for the um, movie uh, The Rising. Um, hang on, The Rising uh, Light, 2013, Hollinsworth Productions. We have questions in in the um, chat, so I'm going to uh, let Ansel take it. But um, Scooby in the chat is asking. Who is Dr. Mabuse and what time frame is it, are these stories set in? So I think I'll just let you give a fast history of who Dr. Mabuse is. Right. Uh, Dr. Mabuse was uh, one of the very first supervillains in literature. Um, he was created by uh, an author named Norbert Jacques way back in Germany. I want to say Germany. And um, he... Uh, Fritz Lang, um, this very famous German film director, uh, did this trilogy of films about him. And uh, Dr. Mabuse, uh, basically he inspired every single supervillain that's to come, like the Joker, Lex Luthor, every single James Bond villain. Um, and uh, w what I did is I took uh, the character and sort of reinvented him and, um, you know, for a modern audience uh, and uh, made a film about him. And it takes place in sort of a it's sort of a netherworld, uh, uh, like a steampunk 1920s uh, location. You're not quite sure if it's Germany, America, or England. And uh, it's kind of set in its own world. And it's almost like a film noir. Yeah, it is a, our, uh, our film is set kind of in a, almost a little bit of a film noir, um, psychological thriller type of atmosphere yeah. for, for this Dr. Mabuse. Yeah, Dr. Mabuse is uh, the 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 saying with him is don't let him get into your mind. He's a master yeah. at mind control, right? Yeah, a master of hypnosis, uh, a master of disguise, um, a master gambler. He plays with basically people's lives, and uh, he's a very cool villain that people have forgotten about. And um, I always liked him growing up, so I wanted to do something. I did too. I like those yeah. old vil villains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're they're, um, they're cool for you know their time and um, you know what what they had to uh, their resources. You know the original movies were done right after World War One and and Germany was just in a state of like a depression basically and they had to make these opulent uh, you know thrillers on you know with nothing and they mm -hmm. accomplished it made them look really great so. Another thing that about these old uh, these old villains like Dr. Mabuse and the cabinet of Dr. Caligari and all of this stuff is it was a bit before censors took over completely. So these guys were really bad. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it, it, they could shock the living daylights out of you. I mean, you know, even the House of Usher, you know, she's laying in a coffin, screaming her bloody brains out, and he's sitting upstairs, you know, and and it's okay. And, and anybody else would be horrified beyond belief, but he's okay, and you're okay because it's a controlled situation. You're not in danger. But they were rough stories. I mean, um, it, it kind of reminds you of Claude Rains' uh, The Invisible Man. Well, we'll kill little people and big people, you know. We don't want to look like we're doing any favorites here we're just going to kill them all you know right. and that was the mentality around. yeah These they they really they were crazy yeah and they're also commenting on society at the time uh, doctor abuses used uh, back in the 20s uh, to uh, comment on the sort of making money off of the war and then in the 30s he was uh, uh, a metaphor for hitler and in the, the 60s he was a metaphor for cold war paranoia so What's great about these characters is that you can take them and apply them to, you know, what's going on in society, and um, and they fit, you know, scarily enough. So, not to mention, it's it's set in kind of a patriarchal society too. So the idea of having a woman inform <clears throat> a man of things is is uh, kind of questioning the norm, and so that's a, kind of an interesting part of the first one that that we, mm -hmm. we play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and um, it, the uh, it, the first one, the way he decides, hey, if anybody doesn't agree, he's got a he's got a way to deal with that. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and he's, he's and ready. Derek, to yeah, uh, Derek is one of the first people to get tested. Yeah, 
you know, um, it, it, they were they were rough those those villains because there was no such thing as anybody um, saying, "Oh my God, you know, they can't kill women and children," and "Oh my God, this is horrible." There was nobody saying that. There were no, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, government officials standing over their shoulders saying, "Oh, oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, that's too rough." And that's yeah. what made those movies really good too back then. Um, right. They took your real fears. Um, I don't know if a little history lesson here, but, um, you know, Hitler, uh, he hated the Jews, but the company that made the um, uniforms for the uh, soldiers were um, actually a Jewish firm, and they ended up being the firm that made state trooper uniforms. Wow, really? Yeah. So that tells you how screwed up it was back then. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, another ah. good story is that um, uh, Hitler wanted Fritz Lang uh, after he saw. Um, well, he was always a big fan of Fritz Lang's work, and um, mm-hmm. he offered Fritz Lang the power. Uh, I think ministry uh, minister of uh, entertainment, and Fritz Lang said, "But I'm half Jewish," and they said, "Well, we decide who's Jewish and who's not." So that's, that's yeah. what's always kind of pretty scary. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it, you know, really, it was a pick and choose, and, and it's what I need. If I can use you, then, uh, you know, mm-hmm. we're going to use you. So that's that's who Dr. Mabuse is. And you know what? Because uh, Scooby asked that, um, would you mind terribly if we played the Dr. Mabuse uh, uh, trailer? teaser? No, the trailer? Okay. Yeah, no. So let me, let me uh, do this. Okay, uh, we do have another question, and I got to tell you, I giggle every time I hear that because of Laura Parker's laugh. That mm-hmm. laugh is infectious. She's got a great laugh in that. Um, it, it, another question is being asked, is it just, and it's from Scooby-12, um, is it just a coincidence that abuse is in the name Mabuse? Uh, no, actually, it's, uh, no, it's not really. It's um, in French, um, mabuse, mabuse, uh, it means to abuse oneself. So, right. uh, uh, with, with, within the context of the original character that Norbert Jacques created, um, he was all about, you know, sort of abusing power in, in a way, 
I hope I hope I don't I'm not screwing up this information. It's been a while since I've, I've dealt with doctrine of abuse, but uh, abuse almost sabotaging oneself, and um, you know. Uh, so I yeah, think, I think <laughs> no, it's, it's not more, a coincidence. I think it's more no. in the good of trying to better the world. You know, in doing that, right. the, the title is. It's not just that he's trying to destroy and have power over everything. It's that. I mean, even Hitler, you know, he's a, he's a terrible human being, but he, in his mind, he was trying to better the world, and it's kind of the same principle with Dr. Mabuse, and in the process, he's going to destroy himself. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Derek, right. for bailing me out there. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's not that they're trying to destroy the world, but they understand somebody's got to come in, take charge, and get things going the right way. And sometimes mm -hmm. that means you got to be a real heavy, and anybody who's a parent, just being a parent, you're right in that perfect position to know this. You know, um, yeah, you want to be your kid's friend, you want your kid to be open with you, but on the other hand, um, it's a child, it's, it needs direction, it's going off in a terrible direction, and, and now you've got to stop it. And you're right, Hitler in his head thought, he could do a better job than what was going on. Um, there was a lot of uh, economic problems, not so different from what's happening right now, right? Right, yes. It's scary. It's actually we're, we're in the same position. The Great uh, Depression uh, of 1929, um, you know, everybody is, uh, when the United States goes down into a depression, the rest of the world is going to feel it. And then all of a sudden, it's, wait a minute, wait a minute, somebody do something, even if it's wrong. Do something. Just stop mm -hmm. it. And these people, in their own screwed up way, um, did stop some of it. The problem is, once they got all the power, they became drunk with it. Dr. Mabuse is very much like that. He's going to run the world, and anybody who doesn't behave well is going to answer to him. He'll take care of it. There's not going to be this fighting back and forth with people. Right. Doesn't he, he, Anybody that gets in his way and doesn't act the way he wants him to act, he's going to take care of them um, in the most drastic ways possible. This is the way it's going to yeah. be. If you're not with me, then the hell with yeah. you. I'm going to take you out. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like a King Solomon deal. Look, I don't know who this baby belongs to, but I'll cut it in half. You can both have half. And that's it. End of argument. He, no, no squabbling in the ranks. If you've got mm -hmm. a problem, bring it to me. I'll solve it. End of problem. Next. And, yep. and that's, kind of, that, that's kind of the arch villain disease. They thought they were so brilliant they could take all the problems that humanity has and just make them go away. And uh, and that's scary because obviously that's impossible. Um, the new movie uh, is kind of a flip because y you do have um, a bad guy in it who um, wants to do bad things, and then this poor guy gets dropped here from nowhere, um, and and he knows nothing, and and. Before we started, I said, you know, I, I don't care how innocent you are. Um, you got to wonder when you somebody finds you laying someplace and they say, oh, you don't know where you are. You don't know anything. Okay, come on, get in my car. That don't happen yep. in reality. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, if you go, if you come from it, as, like if, if um, um, Danny was dropped from wherever and... Um, Picked up with the sense of uh, the innocence of a child. I mean, the classic, you know, don't talk to strangers, don't get yeah, in don't yes. talk to car. Somebody's got some candy. Don't go over to the van that by this person that has the candy because something bad could possibly happen. So that, as yeah. a child, as a or Daniel, as kind of almost an innocence of a child, goes along with it, and he's like, this, he believes in this guy. He doesn't know any different. He believes this guy is actually or is his friend, and they go on this journey mm -hmm. together. And I would almost argue that that's, that's how we are as, as human beings. Like, I think everything else is kind of socially learned. But if you, if, you, if you encounter somebody when you haven't really understood a lot about the world, you're going to trust them if they have that trustability, that, that, like, that likeness, and you're going to go mm -hmm. with them because you believe in them. And 
and until and, uh, their trust is yeah, taken away. Proven, yeah, until uh, you, you know, You're going to, and Daniel basically, as, as Nate has said, he, he is an innocent, and this movie is about the death of innocence. And, uh, you know, he makes a mistake, as like a little kid would, and it just happens to be a very big mistake, and there's going to be some <laughs> massive consequences. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But it was a, it was a funny, yeah. Yeah, he has to learn from his mistake in order to be a greater being than. And that's you know, how we are as humans. We learn by our own our own experiences. You know, we have good experiences, and we know what's good, and we have the bad ones, and we know not to do that. And we don't learn from other people's mistakes either. We don't we don't value wisdom here. The peop- humanity doesn't do that. You know, my mother used to say, "Oh." If only I knew what I knew now back then, you know, and of Mm -hmm. course that's not possible, but I always listen to my mother, and when she says, okay, this isn't going to work, and I'll tell you why, I would listen to her, you know, because she's been there, she did it. Now, unfortunately, most people and most kids don't ever do that, you know, they don't sit there and look at their parents and say, okay, I'm pretty sure you must have had something like this go down, Okay, mm-hmm. you didn't screw chickens in Macy's windows. Drop that part. And you didn't hear it from me. But did you do this? And and most parents can relate to almost anything. Kids can bring them, but um, kids don't listen yeah. to them. Kids are very it's tough. They want, to, they want to learn on their own, and they don't want any help. And so pretty much do the opposite of what, we're, of what they're told. Yeah, and, and that yeah. happens in the film. Uh, Catherine Lee Scott, who plays uh, Daniel's mother, Aya, she tells him, be careful who you trust. Be careful, you know, who finds out about you. Be, you know, watch out for yourself. And like all great kids, he listens, but he doesn't listen. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, it backfires. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's basically, it's, uh, it's about somebody growing up um, and, uh, and, and childhood. And, and um, yeah, just, just making mistakes along that way and, and finding out who you are and who you're supposed to be in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, no, you're all you're all very young men. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if didn't I put that well? Didn't I put that nice? Yes. Yes. You, you did put that well. very well. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, Derek uh, is uh, well. Um, I'm not going to say the baby because how old are you, Ansel? I just turned 22. So, so you're the baby. That makes you the baby. Yeah. baby. I'm yep. the baby, and I'm the boss of all of them. So <laughs> it's kind of a very strange paradox. Actually, that's how most houses are run. The baby runs everything. <laughs> yep. Don't yeah. get the baby upset. <laughs> I don't care. Do it. <laughs> Just go do it. Just do it. Here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. Um. So you guys, uh, Derek, you're 25. Nathan, you're 34. And mm-hmm. considering that I'm older than dirt, um, you know, you are all babies to me. Uh, is it is it a rough way to make a living being actors and, and directors? Yeah, I, it is rough, but I mean, it's it's sort of something that you can't really deny. I mean, it's it's if it's something from within, you have a reason to 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 do that to to listen to that voice that speaks from within. You know, it's like. Mm-hmm. Kind of the, the idea that if you go through it in your your mind, you're going to go through it in your body. So if you you believe in a certain thing, then you're going to experience that, and you'll find a way to make it work. It's it's very mm-hmm. much it's very much a survival pattern, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, um. I mean, go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's tough being out here and you know wanting to pursue like what you feel like you should do, but along the way you have to you know make money, you have to live, you have to eat, you have to pay rent, and you have to pay bills. And when your acting is something that you're passionate about, can't pay your bills, then you just get to keep pursuing it and keep it as not really a, a hobby, I guess, but more of doing shows or just kind of keeping active all the time to keep pursuing that keep dream. Keep your craft alive. Keep your craft alive, yeah. Mm-hmm. Is it very much, because uh, you guys are younger, um, is it very much like, like the old days when... Um, you know, what is that movie with Katherine Hepburn and Ginger Rogers and all of them where all the girls Page. were in the rooming house? Uh, you know, they, yeah, right. Uh, you, you know, is it still that way where you all band together, rent places, and 
uh, when somebody's got money coming in, they buy the food that week, you know, uh, or um, is it different uh, now? So much. With mm. us, yes. I would say with us, it's a brotherhood. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we yeah. A... I mean, we help each other out for sure, and mm-hmm. we help each other if somebody's down, you know, help that person find a job or, you know, pick them up or, you know, help them out in any way you possibly can. Mm-hmm. So, yes, I guess in that way it would be a brotherhood. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, it's, it's, the business has changed. Well, the um, business has changed so much now. And changing still. Yeah, um, I, I think independent movies are probably the way it's going to go. Um, you see Schwarzenegger, all of them, uh, the other one, uh, they're all making the, the older guys are making those movies now where the, expendables or whatever the heck they're supposed to be mm-hmm. but they're all going to they do the movie then they go right to dvd because that's where the money is now mm-hmm. yep they'll have a limited theatrical release and then go to dvd or netflix or online or start selling them online yeah i think mm-hmm. i think you now it's it, it's changed but almost for the better because the power is back in the artist's hands as opposed to uh these big studios um, and with the with the power being in the artist's hands, they have more control over what they create and, and you know how how their uh, career is affected. Mm-hmm. And, and online, I mean that's where that's where it's all going. And uh, I mean like this film, we're releasing it online to get the broadest audience possible. Um, right. Because sometimes it's not about the money, and I say that lightly, but it's about just getting your art you know seen by as many people mm-hmm. possible. Because there's nothing worse than slaving away and 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 making this, you know, making a film and and uh, hoping that it's going to get screened and hoping somebody's going to see it, and well, it doesn't, and it just basically it just it dies on a disc somewhere in yeah. your basement. Like when Blockbuster was around and now they're starting to go away, you'd put them on DVDs and you'd try to get them to people. That would be the way to get your movie out there. Then somebody's going right. to have to drive to Blockbuster see your movie, somehow pick out your movie that you made, amongst and then thousands of amongst thousands of others, which now you can, somebody's on Facebook or anywhere, they can be, oh, this person looks interesting, boom, go to their website or YouTube, look them up on YouTube, and bam, all of a sudden you have a bunch of things that they have done just right in front of your face within two or three minutes if you ever want to look somebody up on the internet. It's just, and media is so quickly there Everything's now. at our fingertips. Today. Yeah, it certainly is easier to access our fans because with a with a post on Facebook or Twitter, we can rally them and, and let them know what's what's coming up and you know what's in store. Mm-hmm. And that is, is a, a very fortunate thing that we have now. Yeah, I think Steven Seagal was probably one of the big heavyweights to finally realize before anybody else he caught on that just go directly to the the DVD, sell it, get it on the market. Because uh, it was getting harder for him to get, uh, you know, the studios and all to put them, you know, have a theatrical release. Um, And it's ironic because now AMC theaters are, uh, tomorrow night, all all the AMC theaters are going to have White Christmas for one night only, you know. And people are dying to see those back on the the, the big screen. But... It's so expensive in the theater now, people have to pick and choose. So the smarter part of Valor, I guess, is get it to, like you say, get it to the audience as easily as you can, you know, and make them want more. And also yeah. just the amount of money that's spent on marketing a film. And you don't, mm-hmm. sometimes you'll never get your audience, you know, into the theater. Um, with online, your movie, you know that it's going to find an audience. It might take some time, but. The, the audience is out there, and they will find it if they, you know, if they want to see something like what you've made. I hope that makes sense. Um, mm-hmm. You know, but just I mean, you see, like uh, this past summer, like with something like Man of Steel or Pacific Rim. The, um, maybe not Pacific Rim. That movie wasn't marketed very well, I have to say. But like, let's say Man of Steel. The marketing on that, the billboards and posters, and you know, there was that whole thing with, you know, how does the Man of Steel shave, and just constant barrage of marketing. Um, and that costs millions of dollars now. Now your marketing budget is almost the same budget as your production budget. And with independent mm-hmm. film, you don't have that at all. You, you've got to rely on word of mouth and, you know, Internet. So 
and your quality. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you, um, when you do these movies, um, do you do all the editing? Ansel, do you ask those guys to come in and, and help with the editing, or is this all on you? Most of the time it's on me. I have to say that with this film, um, I did actually have Nate and Derek uh, take a look and uh, give me their thoughts and notes on the, uh, on the film. Because this movie was very strange. It did not start out as a as a movie. movie. It sure, started yeah. out as like a, a web series. And we were going to have like six episodes be about five minutes long. And um, so, we, so then we filmed some in um, September with Catherine and everybody, and then I think yeah, Catherine... We shot, through, we shot through September September through January. Well, yeah, and then Catherine is like, we should make it into a feature, so then we went back and wrote a little bit more, just not too much more, actually, and just kind of added a couple more scenes. and Yeah, added stuff that was always mentioned and talked about, but that we would never see. And then we just showed it, and then... Yeah, so it kind of went through a couple stages, and Nate and Derek were really great to help me sort of give me their notes and, and let me know you know, kind of where, because in the beginning we had this certain in, or view of what we wanted the film to be, um, how we wanted it to feel, how we wanted it to just... It was much more like be. a sort of a Terrence Malick um, Tree of Life experimental film with very little dialogue and, and just more about visual mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and the visual think... impact. And then it just kind of took on a life of its own yep. and um, grew into the story that it ultimately became. Um, you know, getting there was a bit, you know, not rough, but it, it was a bit more... It was a good journey. It was yeah. A, yeah, it was a fun journey. It was different than we've done before, and we um, never quite, we've learned. You, 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 know, you never knew what, what we were, um, what we were going to do next, you know, with, mm -hmm. with as far as story and, and how to um, really expand that into a, a feature. Normally, you know, mm -hmm. when, I'm, when I'm writing, I have a whole script and everything's planned out meticulously. This one was just, let's just go out and let's do it, uh, which was really sort of refreshing, I have to say, uh, right after, coming right off of Doctrine of Abuse, which was, you know, very strict, you know, to the letter, we got to do it, this, 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 that, and we were locked in the blue screen, uh, you know, and locked this on one stage, and this one we were just like out on mountaintops and canyons and, and all these locations, and really having fun and, and you know, experimenting with the medium. And, um, and it was fun for me and Derek as well because we were so used to acting in front of the blue screen and like having Ansel point at the wall and say, you know, say your lines to this dot or whatever over here and this is the yeah. person you're talking to, which now when we got to go out into the woods and the rocks and everything and run around. It's all and, tangible now. Yeah, now we can right. actually feel the objects and feel the things and give lines and you can feel the the air around you and like the yeah, breeze that's actually major. there. That's for sure. You can't fake that. Yeah. So that brought out the level of honesty. I think that was required. Yeah, you know. I loved I loved the scenery. Um that was all we're in California. Uh yeah, it, uh I don't all over like yeah. Chatsworth was uh was a little bit of in Chatsworth, Topanga Canyon. Topanga Tuna Canyon, uh -huh. um, Franklin Canyon, basically every single canyon we have in Los Angeles County, we were there. Uh, pretty much all, mm -hmm. all the only places left that are still in nature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let me yeah. ask you something. You're doing outside filming, and um, I did see Dr. Mabuse, the uh, scenes at the end, um, what are they, the extras, where evidently a squirrel was on the roof yeah. of the... Yeah, um, that was kind of funny. Um, that yeah. was actually kind of funny because uh, obviously you have to stop. So did you have like planes going over and have to stop and do yeah, the old we, clear? We had, we had a couple. <laughs> we had a couple incidents. A couple that yeah. happened. The blue screen room is pretty close to an airport, so there's quite a bit of times where you have to stop and like with the squirrel incident, there's nothing like being in this intense scene with your partner and then all of a sudden you hear a. Like what? Is, you just stop. Like what is that? With the squirrel on on the yeah. roof running across. Yeah, and what did you do? Go beat it up after that? <laughs> because <laughs> finally, Ansel, Ansel yeah. says, "I'll take care of this." <laughs> yep. I think one time the squirrels were having coitus, weren't they? No. <laughs> yeah, I think, that, I think that was actually the time. The one time we had the squirrels. But uh, but you know, whenever you're filming, there's. There's going to be little incidents here and there that you just got to deal with. Um, yeah. You know, that's that's just a natural part of the work. 
uh, yeah. but with the uh, rising light, yeah, we had, you know, a couple incidents. You know, sometimes we got rained out, or you know, we, we couldn't film on one day because it was just, the weather was horrible, or we had no cover set because we were out on location the whole time. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe it'd be cloudy, or yeah, something well, would we, happen, and we, we just wait a little while and yeah. kind of hang out and get some food or do whatever, and then maybe the sun would come out, and then we go because we shoot. we've got a very very limited crew. And uh, it's basically just us out there filming, so mm-hmm. we don't we, we didn't have to worry about you know a whole bunch of you know forty some people, and that's that's nothing on a, a big Hollywood set. Forty some people waiting around doing something. It was us, mm-hmm. so there was a lot of freedom there. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, every every film has their instance, but you just you deal with it. Yep. So so basically, I, I like the process you're of that. all you're all learning every aspect of this. Uh, making a movie yep. bit, right? Yes. Yeah, I mean, like now, I'm, 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 like for myself, I'm starting to get into this thing of what what can I do more? And I've been acting in some films now. What else can I do? And now it's, Barbie wants to figure out how to, what the financing aspect of it and how do you get these other actors in your films? And, you know, you, you, yeah, the producing aspect and you just want to learn everything. I think the more that you know about the filming world, the better actor or you know artist you become, because you're not mm-hmm. just stuck into this one mindset of all I have to do is show up. I don't know how anything else works, but I just have to show up, deliver my lines, and leave. Which, when you come from a producer side or whatever, and have written before, you know kind of all the aspects and steps it takes to actually make a movie, and how much time mm-hmm. and energy it actually does take to make a feature film. So. Mm-hmm. And yeah. how how much have you changed from uh, when you first started? Uh, I'll start with Derek. How much have you changed since you first decided to be an actor out there and actually working in these movies? How have you grown? Immensely, immensely. Uh, man, I would yes. I <clears throat> my, my mentality was. Um, was was very much a juvenile, um, but understanding how understanding more about yourself, I think, is has been the the, the journey for me. It's more self discovery. Um, I think, to me, uh, an actor is someone who has the most amount of life experience possible, and I think that's something that I'm trying to achieve um, personally. But yes, I would say I've grown to an enormous level. Still mm-hmm. a long way to go, though. Mm-hmm. Well, you're you're young and and you know um, all I ever think of is when I watch this stuff and and I know you guys are young and Ansel is is just starting out. I think of of what happened to a bunch of guys in college, George Romero with Night of the Living Dead, and now he's an icon in the business. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The world, yeah. the world's open to you guys. Little steps that little steps that you have to take to um, keep learning and learning to uh, move up, I guess. Is what we're doing right yeah. now. Um, okay, Nathan, how have you? Ha- how has your journey, when you started out to where you are now? Um, I say I came out to Hollywood with blinders on, almost. <laughs> um, you just think Hollywood for me was just this huge, um, amazing thing. And then you just held it on such a high pedestal. And now I just think now it's slowly getting taken down and taken down. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, I started off doing theater, so to be on stage and um, and to do some improv acting as well, and to kind of be a little bigger as an actor, like acting anyway, wise, to come in and start doing it in front of a camera, and watch, being able to watch Jerry Lacey and watch Catherine and Laura and uh, Christopher Pennock and everybody just to get that experience of watching them and see how they act and to learn from them has just been an amazing experience. I I think that it has helped me immensely. And just being able, like, with Lyndon, um, doing scenes with Lyndon and being the films that I was with him, just watching him um, say his lines and all the heart that he gave his lines and when he did them was just, uh, it was amazing to watch and be there for it. Mm. Um, it, when you look 
look at, at at him. And like I said, that man had an incredible, incredible, uh, you know, career. Uh, did you feel, oh, my God, you know, don't screw it up for this guy? He's paid his dues. Uh, <laughs> let's yeah, not, let's not screw it up. Yeah, in the, in the beginning, in the first couple of films, we did, but... You know, every once in a while, he would screw up, and then we would just kind of laugh about it, and, you know, mm-hmm. it kind of lightens lightens the moment. It just kind of lightens everything to have that thing of, like, yes, you can screw up. Sometimes you are going to forget your lines, and you can redo it and do it again, and Lyndon, everything will be mm-hmm. okay. Lyndon was the ultimate professional, but he knew never to take the work too seriously. And yeah. I think that's what Nate's trying to say. Yep. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Yeah, I, uh... And I, be amazing go. the next yeah, I um I'm very fortunate. I I live you know uh, an hour's train ride from uh, Broadway, so I got mm-hmm. to see Angela Lansbury in um our, uh what is it um Blight Spirit uh, two years ago, and I can't think Rupert Rupert Holmes was uh, the main character in there, and uh, I can't think of the the girl's name that played his wife. And because it was a pre-opening one, they they weren't they were still ironing things out, you know, and it yeah. was like that kind of thing. Um, they forgot their lines, and she's sitting. He forgot his lines, and she's waiting, and she's finally sitting on this couch, and she starts laughing, and she holds a pillow up and buries her head in the pillow, and it actually was it was great because it's live. And all, yep. but you know, it, it, at least with a film, you can do over. <laughs> yep. the, yeah, with a film, you can definitely do over compared to theater, where you just have to, you just have to keep going. You forget your lines, and I've had moments like that as well, where I'm like on stage in front of a bunch of people, and I just draw a blank for like a, a maybe mm-hmm. a couple of seconds, ten or fifteen seconds, and you just kind of keep walking around, pace, and then boom, maybe they'll come, and then off you go again. So. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's yeah. the beauty of live theater, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Ansel, you said if you want realism, go outside, walk down the street, or go into buildings and watch people. Don't go to the movies. Want to elaborate on that? <laughs> yeah, that's um, that's kind of become something of a famous quote of mine uh, since I said it last year. Uh, yeah, just, you know, movies, movies, when they started out, they were basically... They allowed an audience to to escape and to enter dream worlds, and um, I I still hold by that. I, I don't think a movie should be too realistic. You know, you're you're you want to be entertained. You want to escape from your life. You will you go watch a movie. You, there should be a little bit of magic to it. I think. And mm-hmm. uh, so I, in all my films, I try to have that sort of artificial reality, um, and uh, some, uh, not a fantastical element, but a kind of a magical element to each film, um, either in the style or the story or the characters, um, because ultimately this is a piece of entertainment. It's not reality. If you want reality, you can watch the news or watch a documentary. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's that's basically where that quote came from. That's just mm-hmm. always my thinking. I think that I'm going to do a little plug on <laughs> one of my own films that I wrote and Ansel directed. Um, a film that we called probably the closest that Ansel has come to realism would be um, The Gambling Man that I wrote okay. and Ansel directed a little while ago, but there's still, with that, it's on YouTube right now, but with that, there was still an essence of, I don't know. This is a movie. So yeah, like this is a movie. It's still it's kind of like a weird adventure, even though it's very dark, and um, mm-hmm. it's still just a little different, so you know that this isn't quite real. So mm-hmm. that's the closest you ever came to something with realism. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, that, that yeah. anyway. Yeah. Um. E- e- did you guys watch the um, Walking Dead finale the other night? Yes, I did. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, I'm going to put it out there. We're a Marine family here. Why didn't somebody just shoot the governor flat out right at the beginning when he yep. stood on the goddamn? You know, uh, you're standing yep. right there. Your chest is out. Just shoot him. End of war. That's it. Everybody's yeah, I'm thinking the same thing. I, I, we're all looking at saying, like shoot him. Got, just shoot him. Going over there. Just get rid of him. Do it. <laughs> and they did. Shoot the guy. 
guy. I know, he's, and then you sit there and watch the TV, and in the end you're like, okay, yeah, I know, okay, it's just, it's just a TV show, don't get so worked up. <laughs> yeah, but, but it, it's... There's it, the drama. Yeah, George Romero was asked to uh, direct uh, uh, a couple of uh, episodes, I guess, last season, and he said no, because it's a soap opera with a couple of zombies thrown in once in a while. And it was getting to be that. Um, you know, it, it, yeah. once, you get, once you get a group of people into a position where it's a daily routine, then it becomes, oh, all the drama and the cat fights and all that, you know. Yeah. And, and there's no way to avoid that because that's, that's life, you know. Once you get into yeah. that routine and and it's the same thing every day and you know okay so they they kill a couple of walkers now and again and then uh, they go back to fight over whose turn it is to do the wash or whose turn it is to do this or mend the fence you know um Mm -hmm. but yeah i think i think everybody in the country was standing there screaming at the tv sunday night saying shoot him just shoot him don't talk to him just shoot him (laughs) yep and that's the entertainment um, factor that you'd like to have in the film. Yeah, you know, um, it, you know, and there's something else about that movie. Do we not have any American actors who could have played uh, uh, the sheriff in that? We mm-hmm. had to import a bunch of people from England to play those parts. I think Australia. Is, am I the only one who thinks that? Yep. I, I think some of the best actors out there are, are actors that they just handle villain roles so all the more better than uh, than Americans do. That's just, it's just my opinion. Well, even yeah. Superman, the British, yeah, as well, yeah, Henry Cavill, yeah, yeah. I mean, you watch something like Gettysburg or some, half of the 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 generals and all were actually uh, you know British uh, English actors. And I'm thinking to myself, what are you telling me? We do not have any American so- people, actors, who can play American generals or what? You know, come yeah. on. You know, it's just, it, it's just, uh, it was ironic. And I guess, uh, you know, that's the industry now. It, it, it used to be, if you were in Hollywood, you were okay. They went for Hollywood um, every now and again. Somebody might say, oh, well, there's this British actress, you know, Selznick's brother-in-law. Just give her a chance because he wanted an American actress to be Scarlett O'Hara. You know, that was the way it was back then. Now, actors and actresses are competing with actors and actresses all over the world for things yeah. in their own backyards. Mm-hmm. I, feel, I think, too, is a lot of the, um, a lot of the, 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 the big wigs, if you... If if you want to say that, are, are, are not willing to take chances on uh, scripts that may may not bring a big box office draw as opposed to movies in Australia or England will take that chance because they're not as big and, and heavily reliant on the box office. You know, look at a movie like Candy with um, uh, Geoffrey Rush and Heath Ledger, a bit of a chance, in it. but it kind of yeah. brings the... Um, it brings over the the international actors for that because the, they see that they see that they're they're able to carry these roles that are very art, artistic and uh, American actors don't get I don't think that opportunity as much unless you're one of the big A-listers. Yeah, so jo- a, Johnny a, Depp gets to be gets to be a pirate that with an English accent. What what right, the heck exactly. is that? Yeah, extremely entertaining, even though it's the farthest thing from an English accent. You know. Really, it is. Well, uh, it, it, you you guys are acting with uh, three people, four people now. Um, now that Christopher Pennock is is uh, working with you, uh, who did Dark Shadows, and and Jonathan Frid um, had a horrible English accent because he was born in Canada, not that far from the United States, and he says, but it was okay because you know he was. You know, he had a lousy English accent. You know, he kind of worked it in. It's okay, you know, because... They all had mid-Atlantic uh, accents, really. Sort of yeah. quite English, not quite American. But then Dark Shadows was its own animal, so I think it worked, you know. It, the, uh, it all the worked, act. because everybody knew it was just make up Yep. Yeah. And nobody cared. They were too busy wanting to see what was going to happen, you know. Yeah, and, and, and the vampire didn't glitter. 
Yeah. That's, that's, that's a new amazing. thing. Yeah. Yeah, I don't like I don't like vampires who glitter and and <laughs> yeah. you know everybody's trying to save them. Kill them. They're killers. They're animals. We don't want to save them. They're not a, they're not good for anything. You know, it's like zombies. Just kill them. They die, yep. blow their brains out, and get it over with. Let's go on to lunch. You know, yep. um, you know, uh, it, it, movies have changed because now you never know who the audience is going to um, sympathize with. Yeah, yeah, you have so many antiheroes in movies these days because I don't think I, I don't think that audiences today could handle John Wayne going to save everything at the end of the day and you know be all right and be the good guy all the way through. Um, audiences won't buy that. They want flawed characters. Yeah, they, they want, want flawed heroes anymore. That's, anymore. That are, that's very American too. Contradiction. You know, I think that that's what's interesting about characters now is that they're they're very contradictory and that's what kind of draws us to them sort of like uh, Breaking Bad's Walter White he's yeah. a very contradicting character but we're extremely drawn to him because of his charismatic you know and persuasion. we root we root for Walter and we hate Skyler and I think that's very very odd and very interesting that the character who is aware of moral decisions and is is very much a good character the audience hates uh, with a passion, and we all uh-huh. like the bad guy. Uh, and actually, yeah. we're going to be doing a film next year uh, called Todd Tarantula, which is very much an anti-hero film. And uh, Derek is playing Todd, and is a very contradictory character. And so, because I've always liked those type of characters, so we're really going to explore that with that film. And uh, uh-huh. the 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 contradictory anti-hero, the the bad guy that we all like, and uh, yeah. That'll be. That's gonna be fun. Well, I like Doctor Mabuse because yeah. I like Jerry Lacey. I mean, well, who doesn't like Jerry Lacey? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Jerry does a wonderful job in the film. Yeah. If anybody hasn't seen it yet, check him out for sure. Yeah. Jerry, I mean, it, he could be ordering your death, right, Derek? And you're like, okay, it's cool. I actually <laughs> like him. He. It, this is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Business as usual. We're gonna kill Derek. Okay. Those eyes would draw you in. Yep. Yeah. Don't let him into your not, he, he makes he makes the character not seem like it's anything personal. It's just something yeah. that's gonna be done. <laughs> yeah. I, am I right? This business. You're very you're very right. And he does it so effortlessly too. So it, yeah. it's it's just like Yeah, I mean there's really no words for what, what Jerry does in that film and what he also does in the uh, in the second film that we just finished. He's yeah. he's uh, evil, but we like him, and uh, we're fascinated watching him. And 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 uh, even when we were filming, it was very fascinating to watch what was he going to do and and uh, you know how he was going to play a scene. Um, I'm sure Nate and Derek can go into that more. They had to work with him. I just had to watch them. Uh, but uh, yeah, Jerry's brilliant. Yeah, mm-hmm. you don't really have to work with Jerry too much. Usually, it's behind a curtain, delivering lines or doing something until, until I finally he goes for him. Find him. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, Jerry's one of the best and v- such an underrated actor. I feel in the industry. And I do. The I've always guys. felt that. Yeah. Uh, one of the nicest guys I've ever met in my life. Um, mm-hmm. Totally the opposite of Doctor Abuse or Reverend Trask. Uh, he's just. He, he's like Humphrey. To me, he's like Humphrey Bogart and played against Sam. He's always giving me advice, and uh, he's just a, a great guy. Mm-hmm. Oh, he he was great. Um, and I actually have that clip. I think if, if, if at the end of the show I can play it, where um, he's telling Woody Allen, you know, Jesus, and don't put that stuff on you, you know. And, and, and he's mm-hmm. he was great. Um, but yeah, he's he um, in in Doctor Mabuse. Um, he reminds me of the governor, and the governor in The Walking Dead. I liked him. He, you got it. You know it sucks, but I'm going to yep. do it. Now we all know he was a little nuts and thought he could save his kid and maybe reverse what was going on because that was where he was going, he, trying to figure out a way to reverse what had happened. Uh, mm-hmm. When her when her hair came off in his hand, that should have told him she was. Her her expiration date had come, you know, but you know, parents parents will will fight to the bitter end, 
and and that's what he was doing. But even at that, you know, um, Sunday night, it was like uh, I looked at and it says, yeah, well, kill these two morons because they're idiots. You know, uh, I would have rather take my chances with him running the camp than uh, the crazy guy that thought he was back in the army or the other guy who was afraid to do anything, you know? Yep. yep. So I liked I liked the governor. I thought it kind of sucked that they killed him. I would have liked to have seen him and Rick try to run the camp together. That would have been amusing. That would have been a great, great I fight. That for a little while. Um, in, in, in the movie The Rising Light, uh, where did you get the idea from? I always had this idea of uh, initially, I wanted to do like a Twilight Zone type of episode, uh, in black and white and very sort of noirish, the way that Twilight Zone was done, of this mm-hmm. man falling from the sky one night when everybody else is asleep, and he has to find, he has this silver box, and he has to find this other guy and give it to him, and it's going to somehow save the world. And I had this idea floating around in my head for a while, and uh, I talked to Lyndon about it, and he was like, yeah, you know, write it down. You know, sounds interesting. <laughs> and in classic Linden style. And uh, then uh, just before Doctor Reviews, I had the full idea, okay, well, what if this other guy is also after this box? And they obviously have to cross paths. And just, I, I don't remember it if I... from there. Yeah, I don't even remember if I told you, Nate, when we were filming Doctor Reviews this idea. I know I told Catherine the idea, and mm-hmm. she said that sounds very interesting, and that's how she got involved with the project. Um, but yeah, it just sort of, it was floating around in my head, and then there was some time, so I said, let's do it. Mm-hmm. And she she plays the mother of this this being who's dropped in the middle of nowhere, and um, she she's very believable, you know, she goes up against the powers that be, uh, when yes. she's told to butt out, she she's very you know, she's kind of like what I would do. <laughs> you you did yeah. not just tell me that. You didn't yeah. you didn't she's think I was going to listen. Yeah, so she's very believable in that, and and she's a very solid actress. Yeah, she does a very she's an amazing actress as well. You can't go wrong with it. Yeah, and she's. Mm-hmm. I don't have to direct her much. She just shows up and. She's very I professional. She's yeah. amazing. <laughs> I tell her where to stand, and she does it, and she does it perfectly. So, it's, it's Laura great. is also a great actress, but she always looks like she's up to something. Yeah, <laughs> yes. And, uh, she's just I, got that look. In uh, Doctor Reviews one, uh, Catherine and Laura, they were they. We actually only had them on that film for for one day, and we had to film all their scenes. And I know they're small parts, but you know they're very integral to the story. Mm-hmm. But in the second film, they are. They are the story. It's it's basically it's Catherine versus Laura, and mm-hmm. uh, they they're they're constantly up to something. And and I think there's going to be some really great moments for for the fans and stuff to to see the two of them go at it. Uh, and then you've got Jerry with Lacey versus Christopher Pennock, and so you you know it, everybody's fighting each other, and uh, it's a lot of fun. And Laura mm-hmm. is amazing. Laura's one of, one of the coolest people I've ever met. And uh, yeah, and I also get to have a, more scenes with her in the next film yeah. as well, which is very fun for me. And so we mm-hmm. got to do more in lines, and we had a good time. Yeah, I mean, both Catherine and Laura. You know, Catherine, I always tell her, "You're the best film school teacher that I never had when I was in film school." Uh, I'm always going to her with advice and uh, for advice, I should say, and uh, with projects, with scripts. Hey, Catherine, take a look at this. You know, what do you think of this? And and you know, we're we're constantly talking about you know. Doing this project and that project, and uh, you know, and I love working with Catherine. She's she's great. Mm-hmm. Okay, I got to ask you something because I'm talking about those at the end with the takeout type things. Did Jerry Lacey actually have to show somebody how a phonograph worked and how you put the record up and it dropped? <laughs> well, I that's I had my uncle had this record player that that it was acting up, and I was behind the camera. And we were trying to get the record player to work, and Jerry's like, oh, I think I can tinker with this. And so he he got the record player to start acting correctly. He used his powers of hypnosis on it. 
And uh, I just happened, to, I thought it was kind of a funny moment, so I filmed it and put it on the It was, it was very funny. See, you take this and you put the arm up and you put the record there, put the arm on it, and it drops. And he's it was like, working perfectly you know, during the single, and then it decided to act up as soon as, you know, we turn on the camera, which is always what happens when you're making a movie. Everything's going fine course. when you turn on the camera. <laughs> of course, we're, we're, we have a perfect stream, everything's going wonderful, and then I say good evening, and somebody says, I can't hear anything, the sound's not working, yeah, it's always like that. Um, It'll be quiet, what are you, and then I'll be acting, and then there goes a plane over top. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, that was fun to watch, that stuff with the squirrels and the noise, because, um, you know, it brings you back to, like, when Edison had the Black Mariah here in mm-hmm. Orange. My my father-in-law worked for him. And mm-hmm. uh, so that tells you how freaking old I am. And uh, <laughs> actually, my husband's uh, quite a bit older than me. But uh, yeah, my, my father-in-law worked for Thomas Edison in the factory. And he would watch them. And, you know, there was always noise and, and something being pulled along the road or some ridiculous noise and they'd have to stop even though it wasn't noise it would disrupt everybody trying to figure out what they were doing you know because it it, it's not uh what did they call it a quiet stage where there's no when sound came along and you had so many people that were filming i was watching a documentary the other day and they were talking about they had this uh sounds a a filming location let's call it that instead of a sound stage a filming location in this warehouse by uh, in Brooklyn by this by the train, and when talkies came along, they couldn't film there anymore because the train would go by every three or four minutes and disrupt the the sound recording. So, yeah, you, you, way back then they were constantly dealing with something as soon as they, you know. But like mm-hmm. you said, this is all part of the process, all part of the work. And we have we got to deal with it. Yeah, I I think as um, directors and and production companies have to pull away from the big moguls uh they they have to become um more self-reliant and they have to be able to take snowballs in the face uh that's what i call when something goes wrong you know that disgusting snowball in the face where you go oh for god's sake you know uh it, it it's it's tough you know it's a rough way to make a living um but you guys are doing Phenomenal! I I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm we're doing our best, and we're just chugging along. Keep it going. Yeah. That's it. You keep your face out there, and that's very important. You know, um, to to keep your face out there so that you don't get lost in the one ads. You know, mm-hmm. um, you're always visible. You're always doing something. You're always willing to take a chance. And that's very important, and that's good that you're doing it. I'm going to uh, play uh, um, Madame Carosa. Carosa, is that her name? Carosa. From the, huh? Yeah, Madame Carosa. Yeah, yeah her theme. Um, and then I'm going to bring you back, and, and we'll wind it down, and uh, you can tell everybody all the information where they're going to find you. I, I highly recommend Dr. Mabuse, and now after having seen uh, The Shining Light, um, I think anybody who's into sci-fi and and the, uh, what is it, uh, Doctor Who and and that um, very, uh, what, it, what am I looking for? What is that word I'm looking for to describe them? Existential science fiction road movies thing. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, yeah. It, it's weird. It's weird, yeah. but it works. It's it's a yeah, very. It's, it's, it's something it's, different it's, than you would typically ever see in a science fiction esque type of film. It's not exactly science fiction, but it is. It's not exactly a road movie, but it is. It's not exactly a superhero movie, but it is. And it's it's yeah, it's a conglomeration of a lot of things, but somehow magic, got it. sorcery, <laughs> um, all of that. Aliens, sorcerers, entertaining, entertaining, entertaining yeah. in the end, hopefully. Yep. That's yeah. what it's all about. Okay, so let me play this, uh, and, and we'll be right back. Let me load it. 
Toto? I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Hi, this is Mo Banshee inviting you to listen to Mo Banshee's Lair Visionary Talk Radio every Tuesday evening at 9 p.m. Tune in to Mo Banshee's Lair on Para Rock Radio. We're still rocking your world. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little dog, too. Um, the, uh, that was Madame Carosa's, uh, uh, theme from, uh, Dr. Mabuse. That's a very haunting, uh, uh, tune. Um, and like I was trying to say, cause I, I have to listen to the music so I can follow it. Um, I'm just glad you guys could be on, um, and that we can help you. Um, uh, tell yeah, everybody it's, where it's, they can find everything. You can go to the uh, uh, Hollywood Productions website. Uh, a lot mm-hmm. of our movies are on there, uh, and essays and pictures and all this stuff about our films. It's www.hollandsworthproductions.com. And then for if you're just interested in Dr. Mabuse, uh, www.drmabuse-themovie.com. And then there's a whole bunch of Facebook pages uh, for Hollywood Productions, The Rising Light, Dr. Mabuse. Um, you can look up, I'm sure, yeah, Cancel Derek's or my name. Yeah, as we're, well we're on, on Facebook, and um, we have a lot of things going on under our Facebook pages right now as well. Different yeah. projects yeah. that we're working on and have been doing and are continuing to do. Yep. Yeah, um, on my Facebook, you can find everybody's links. Um, and, of course, that's Mo Banshee Asylum. You can find everybody's links or just ask me and I'll, I'll get it to you. Um, you guys are doing wonderful, and I'm very, very proud of you all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mo. You're amazing as well. Thank you for having us <laughs> yeah, on your thank show. Thank you for, for allowing us to come on and promote our work. And, you know, it, we... Like we've said before, the independent market, you have no marketing budget. And to just get to be able to explain your work and explain your movies on your show has just been a godsend and for, it's nice for me. <laughs> it's nice to be able to put forth a lot of work and all the time and effort it takes to do these movies and the time and effort it has taken us to get to where we are, acting, directing, writing, producing, and all of those things. It's nice to have like a little outlet to show people. And just glad that you're here to help us out. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, you know, um, my f- a lot of people say, well, two hours is too long, you know, an hour and a half for an interview. But when I see people who their entire livelihoods depend on being, you know, getting the word out, and then they go on a show like The Tonight Show, okay, they're getting like three minutes to tell yeah. everything, and then they're h- rushed right off. And then they're followed by something else, and it's almost like nobody remembers what they said, you know? 
And and I feel bad when I see that because I think to myself, Jesus, these people are working their tails off, and and they should have more time to uh, you know well, the talk to about find themselves. Out who those, these people are instead of pretty much it seems like on these shows they're just there to plug their thing that they're working on, talk a little bit about themselves, and then get off. Which you never yeah, really get to know that person because they're just plugging the work that they're doing. Yeah, and and it, it it's so much more. It's just like anybody else, you know. You got to pay your bills. You got to pay the electric. You gotta you gotta make sure you eat, you know. And uh, you know, it's it's yes, it's an art. It's something that you're passionate about, but it also has to support you. You got to get the word out. It's it, it's a lot of resources taken up in your lives too. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a lot to uh, it's a lot to balance. It's a lot to uh, juggle, you know, to uh, be able to do all these things and to keep going at it year after year. It takes a lot of passion yeah. and heart to stay doing it. Yeah. What's What's next for you, Nathan? Um, right now. You working um, on anything just, now? Um, I've just been doing a lot of improv comedy shows, um, in Hollywood okay. at a IO West, which is an improv theater there. Um, I'll be working on Todd Tarantula. Ansel's next film in March, I believe we're going to start shooting that. Um, I'm working on this other project right now. I'm trying to find out how to get some financing for uh, for one of my friends of mine's films. So I'm starting to try to figure out the producing side and um, see how that all works. So that's kind mm-hmm. of, well, that's not a... <laughs> It's quite a bit, actually, but... That's that's much. actually a lot, yeah. yeah. You're an overachiever right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Derek, what are you... Learn. Yeah, Derek, what are you up to? Um, I've got a, a short film coming out. Um, I think it's going to be coming out in, in January, February, called The End, My Friend. It's uh, uh, basically about a couple who experiences the end of the world in a post-apocalyptic setting. Um not science fiction, but it's very, very much, uh, very much a road-oriented type of script. And I have Ansel's Todd Tarantula coming out, and a few music projects, and um, just life. Mm-hmm. And Ansel, what's coming uh, up next? Well, I've got uh, the Doctor Review DVD coming out at the end of this week, and then um, in February, uh, a short film I did with uh, Chris Pennick. Uh, the Madness of Roderick Usher, based on Edgar Allan Poe's Fall of the House of Usher, is going to wow. be online to watch. And then we go start filming uh, Todd Tarantula. And uh, then in April, we've got the Doctor Movies mm-hmm. 2 premiere in Los Angeles. And, uh, and then we're going to... Is it going to be... Yeah, we're, we've, got, we've got a couple things lined up. So mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's going to be pretty crazy. <laughs> Let me ask you, Christopher Pennock, I've had him on. We're talking the Energizer Bunny here. Oh, um, yeah. yeah, he's quite the gentleman. Chris whoa! All the best. Um, yes, he is. He's he's disarming. He's charming. He's funny as hell. Um, <laughs> it, he just he just keeps going, and you're like, holy smoke! You know, whatever you're on, give me some. Chris and I, we. We're going to be working together for a long time, I think. Uh, we just, as I said, we just did um, Doctrine Abuse 2 together and then the, the Madness of Roderick Usher. And uh, next month in January, we're going to go film another Edgar Allan Poe film, um, A Descent into the Maelstrom. And I told Chris, we're going to be like uh, American Horror Story. Instead of Jessica Lange, it's going to be Christopher Pennock, and uh, it's going to be Edgar Allan Poe movies. And just do them and, and put them out there for, for the audience that wants them. And, uh, and there's a big audience for them. They're timeless yeah. stories. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then Chris is also going to be in Todd Tarantula, along with um, Steve Railsback, uh, mm-hmm. who's a very well-respected actor. He was nominated for a Golden Globe for The Stuntman with Peter O'Toole. And uh, so he's joining our, our repertoire company, and we're really excited about that. And we got a That's couple cool. other surprises lined up. And it's going to be a really crazy year, but hopefully a really fun year. Yeah, it, when it goes by real fast, and I, I'm I'm going to say, has this this year 2013 gone fast for you guys? Yes, yes, it has. Yes, insanely fast. That's what I mm-hmm. I just remember finishing up the first document booth and just being like, oh my god, we got a whole year 
until it's going to be in the theatrical release, and we're going to you know, put it in theaters and go to the Dark Shadows Festival. And I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God. And now that's almost... <laughs> it's done. <laughs> that's, been, that's done, and, like, the year is almost done already on this. And we've already shot Dr. Booth 2, and now we've got the rising light that's coming out. And we've, we've done... And we did a short in between that that I said before that I wrote an answer directed called The Gambling Man. Like, we've done just oh, so God. much work. And, and, and since then, which uh, has been amazing. Yeah, it's just a constant stream of... I mean, this year's been actually a really good year, I have to say. Also, another movie that Nate and I did, uh, it's a comedy, Brother Drop mm-hmm. Dead, which you can watch online. Uh, it's got uh, Nate and Lyndon. Uh, we was at the Buffalo Niagara Film Festival and, and won uh, Best Comedic Screenplay there. And then oh, cool. right after that, we had the Doctor Reviews premiere, and then it was just constantly... Yeah, I mean, it, it, Everything just picked up, and it's not stopped. It's It's... We're still going, and that's the way that we like it. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Um, do you ever consider taking other people's scripts? Has Have people come to you and say, hey, look, I wrote this. What do you think of it, Ansel? Yeah, I've gotten... I mean, some... besides Nate. I mean, he's like yeah. attached <laughs> to you. Yeah, no, he's I've attached to you. Um, I get a lot from uh, from outside writers and stuff. It, mm. it just It really depends on the right script and, and the right, you know, what can I do? Uh, no, more, uh, more, what I should say is, can I apply my vision to this and make this work? And do mm-hmm. I really love it that much that I want to, to work on it? Um, mm-hmm. but, but yeah, I always get scripts from, from writers and stuff. They, they, and uh, and they, what is your favorite, do you see yourself being locked in a genre or do you think you're going to keep yourself open to all genres? Well, I'd like to do a lot. Uh, I guess I, I think I'd have to say probably my strength is probably thrillers, but I'd love to do a musical one day, you know. So when I'm not doing Batman, I'd love to go do <laughs> something like Moulin Rouge. Um, yeah. Or, you know, even, co- you know, I'd like to do whatever, whatever is going to be fun to make, you know, mm-hmm. and can really... Because I mean, movies you you dedicate a year to two years of your life to have whatever right. film you need to make. So that's a lot of time to spend on a project, and you really have to love that, you know, mm-hmm. love that project in order to commit to it. So to me, it really depends on the project that comes along. But within that, w- having said all that, I I would not mind whatever it is: comedy, drama, thriller, musical, horror, that's uh, good. sci-fi, whatever's mm-hmm. out there. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Uh, I want to thank you guys for coming on. And Thanks you know, I'm, I love you all. I, I wish all three of you only the best things that are possible to get. Thank you. Well, thank you thank so you much, Paul. Mm-hmm. And all you've got to do is hang up, and uh, I'll post this on podcast later on, and then it'll be on uh, Facebook, too. Or Perfect. rather, uh, YouTube. Okay? Wonderful. All right. Happy holidays. Okay. Yeah, happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Thank yeah, you. Merry Christmas. Uh, you too. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Kwanzaa. Yeah. Happy, uh, happy if if you celebrate flies, happy fly day. I don't care. Um, God bless you all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank all you right. Mo. Night, night. Night, night. Bye. Uh, that was very cool. I have one song, one song left uh, for everybody, and it's K-Star, and it's my... Uh, actually, two songs. I've got two songs I'm going to play to, uh, you know, bring us into the holiday um, mode of thinking. So this is a, a one from the 40s. It's called Everybody's Waiting for the Man with the Bag. And I hope you guys like it because it's it's kind of the era of, of Dr. Mabuse. And uh, I think you guys will like it. That was Kay Starr, um, and she's a, an Oklahoma girl, and this was a, a really big, uh, you know, uh, song for her, The Man with the Bag, Everybody's Waiting. She's 91 years old now. Um, she she is uh, still uh, alive, and uh, I used to love her. She she was a very classy lady, but she could really get a uh, a room going, and during the 40s and 50s, she was the the girl that sang. She was the Wheel of Fortune, singing Wheel of Fortune. Uh, One more time, she was an incredible singer. So uh, the other song, uh, next week we're going to have Psychic Cheryl Lynn 
Everybody knows Sherilyn from um, the uh, my shows. She's been uh, an incredible uh, person. She's really nailed a lot of the uh, the predictions. She she was pretty much on the money with Sandy. She said we were going to get hit with a really big uh, storm in 2012, and man, did we get nailed. Uh, she said I would be traveling, and at that point, I had no idea I was going anywhere. And uh, in, in November uh, 2012, I went to uh, Ireland. Uh, it just, I had no plans. Uh, it just happened. So uh, she's she's pretty good you know and uh of course it's always uh, you know for fun but i hope everybody will remember that but i hope they'll enjoy it and this is the last song we're going to do and i'm playing it because i think we need a little christmas we need a little fun so uh i hope you guys enjoy this visiting me at my lair. You can always contact me at www.asylumsgate.com. Again, thank you for visiting, and God bless you and yours. Ha, 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 ha.